Good afternoon. Good afternoon and happy Friday, everyone. We are so excited to have you here. My name is uh, Rayette Newman. I'm the interim dean of the College of Education, and I am also honored to be part of the Culture, Cult, Center for Culturally Responsive Practices, otherwise known as CCRP here on campus. With that, I would like to take a moment and thank everyone who is here today this afternoon. I all, we all know that we have lots of things to do. We are in the middle of emails. We are in the middle of a beautiful day. So I do want to acknowledge the time it is taking you out of your Friday to come and be here today. So thank you very much for your time. And with that, I want to do a couple special shout outs. First and foremost, I want to thank Tanya Lubis, who is in charge of CCRP for all of the hard work she has done today. And also to the CCRP committee as well for all of their dedicated time and efforts they have put into this. Um, and with that, we thank you so much for being here again. It is great to see so many faces from so many different um, places here on campus, from different colleges, from different departments, all different buildings. So it's great to see you all. And with that, thank you so much. I'm going to turn it over to Tanya. All right. Thank you, Rhea. Thank you for your support as well. Uh, we're just happy to have everybody here in the room, and we also have folks on live stream, so there will be some interactive components today, and we just ask that you hold your comment until someone gets to you at the mic so our folks online can feel totally engaged and part of the conversation. Um, and then our tech folks will be, Devon in the back, um, will be monitoring uh, any questions that happen online as well. Um, so it's with a great pleasure that I welcome Alex Chevron Vinette, who is here from all the way from Vermont. And um, this session is brought to you in part by funding through the Educator Advancement Council of the State of Oregon. Um, Alex um, is the author of the book we've been using as our common book read this year. There were copies out front. If you didn't get one, you can grab one at the end. Um, and our students have also been reading this together. So exciting to bring her to campus. She's nationally recognized as author and speaker um, who specializes in connecting theory to practice to create equity-centered, trauma-informed schools and communities. She believes all students need a safe and caring school environment that can be created through unconditional and positive regard, recognizing the dynamic and complex lives of students, and her research and writing focuses on trauma-informed teaching, learning, and systems change, social and emotional learning, building and sustaining classroom community, restorative practices, and educational equity. She received a bachelor's degree in secondary education from University of Vermont in English, and a master's degree in education from Antioch University in New England. Alex teaches undergraduate students at a Community College of Vermont in Winooski, uh, in-service teachers and graduate courses at Castleton Center for School and Antioch University in New England, and also facilitates professional development for teachers and support schools as they implement trauma-informed practices. She's also a community facilitator. It's like she works at EOU, right? <laughs> She's also a community facilitator for Edutopia and co-founder of Nurturing the Nurturers Collective, a healing community for educators. Um, and I will say one fun fact, and the students had fun with this last night, is that she's in the Vermont 251 Club, where you attempt to visit all 251 towns and cities in the state. So if time permits, you could ask her what number she's up to today. Mm -hmm. Alex has been featured on a number of podcasts and um, publications, currently working on a book, which she's been working on at the landing while she's visiting here <laughs> as well. So we're just pleased to have her here and have you all join us in a conversation today. Welcome, Alex. Thank you. Hi, everyone. It is so great to be here. I'm loving my first trip to Oregon, and the weather really showed out for me, so I'm happy. I think we, get, I think we have kind of similar weather in Vermont, and so I'm really feeling that like winter is finally over. So now we get what it's like two weeks where it's spring, and then it's like burning hot, horrible summer. So I don't know if it's like that here, too. but. That's back in Vermont as well. Um, as Tanya said in the great introduction, I'm from Winooski, Vermont. Um, I do a bunch of different things with my time, but they all really center around this idea of how do we make schools more equitable and more trauma-informed. And today we'll talk about what does trauma-informed mean 
But I also always like to show and not just tell. So in a trauma-informed environment, we pay attention to how we get ready to learn by feeling connected with ourselves and also feeling connected with each other. So the first thing I wanna invite you to do is to just take a moment, uh, kind of shake off the day you've had so far. You can use a suggestion there on the screen. You can do something else. You could stretch, you could take a big sip of your coffee, whatever you wanna do for just five seconds, just get yourself a little mindful moment here. I do a lot of workshops on Zoom, and when I do this part on Zoom, I'll usually turn off my camera, and invite people to turn off their cameras. And one time I forgot to turn off my microphone, and I was doing these big like, and it was really like a Darth Vader sound effect <laughs> happening, so um, that's a nice thing in person is you can't hear that as much. All right, the second thing we need to do to get ready to learn is feel connected with each other. I grew up in Massachusetts, and so um, this is my very Massachusetts little check-in question. So on the screen, you'll see four versions of Ben Affleck doing errands with his Duncan in his hands. Um, I feel like they represent a spectrum, right? He's got the aviators on, he's looking great, all the way to like maybe that was before he and Jen got back together, he was not doing well. Um, so I would love for you to turn to a neighbor and let them know what number are you feeling today and why. Uh, if you're there on the live stream, maybe just check in with yourself, how you doing? So take a second and turn to a neighbor. goodbye to Ben Affleck, wish him well that he doesn't drop his mail. <laughs> My last reminder to you before we kind of dive in is I want to encourage you to take what you need. By that I mean if you want to stand instead of sit, if you ever need to pop out and get some water, some snacks outside, I'm not going to think anything of it if you're moving around. Also we're going to be talking about trauma. I'm going to be uh, giving some examples. I'm gonna be talking about some impacts that trauma has that can stir things up for people. And so if you're finding that it's stirring you up in a really unpleasant way, um, the great thing is we're recording so you can always leave and come back to the learning later or maybe it's not what you need right now. Um, just take good care of yourself uh, because this, this is about your learning. It shouldn't be overwhelming. All right, so here is our plan. Um, I'm going to sort of walk us through understanding a little bit about what trauma is, how it impacts learning, and then how can we really make this work in higher education? Because if you're at all familiar with trauma-informed education, you probably mostly hear it talked about in a K-12 context. And when we talk about how trauma impacts students, we're almost always talking about younger students. And so we're really gonna think today about how does this impact um, adult learners, basically, because our college students are adult learners. How I'm kind of showing up today is that uh, whenever I facilitate about trauma, I'm always mindful that we're all bringing with us our own experiences, uh, which may be our own individual experiences of trauma. We're also all living in a world that has quite a lot of trauma in it, and so I'm mindful of what we're bringing. My hope is always that you leave actually with more questions than answers. Uh, this is a really big topic, and so I'm kind of hoping to just spark that you will have some avenues you want to learn more about, and that from here you kind of find a place to dig in and, and take this and run with it. So I'll offer some starting points, but really I hope this is just the beginning of your learning. So we're going to start with a little bit of what is trauma and how does it show up in college. So. First, when we're talking about trauma, I want us to be thinking about trauma as a lens, not a label. What I mean by that is that sometimes you hear trauma in the context of 
talking about a specific person who has maybe PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, maybe you're thinking about your own experiences or family and friends who maybe experienced trauma, and you're thinking about, okay, how do I tell if this one person has trauma, and then you know, what's their support that they get to heal from trauma? Um, that's an important aspect of trauma-informed education, but we're gonna go a little bigger than that. We're gonna think about trauma as a lens through which we understand a lot of different things about education. So I'll come back to this point a couple of times, but we're gonna refrain from thinking about how do I pick out the specific students who have trauma and do something different for them? And instead, how do we transform everything so that people who are traumatized, people who are not yet traumatized, and all of us living in a traumatic world uh, can feel safe enough to learn? So defining trauma is actually harder than it looks because there's a lot of different fields that study trauma, right? There's psychiatry and psychology, of course. There are sociologists uh, that look at trauma. There are you know, particular medical fields and subfields. There's all these different ways of looking at trauma. So my definition here, I tried to capture as much of it as I could and we're gonna break it down a little bit. So uh, the definition I have here is trauma can be both an individual and or a collective response to life-threatening events, harmful conditions, or a prolonged dangerous or stressful environment. So it, you, we might think of trauma resulting from something like um, a bad car accident or a natural disaster or sort of one of these kind of lightning strike moments where something really big and bad happens. But the research shows that trauma can also result from living in a stressful period of time where maybe there's not one particular day that rises above the rest, but that consistent feeling of not being safe or feeling a high level of stress can have the same cumulative effects as one of those sort of lightning strikes. So if you think about maybe a person living in an environment where their needs aren't being met and they're not sure where their next meal is coming from. You can think about someone who is constantly being um, uh, bullied or harassed with just little sniping comments every day, right? Nothing ever rises up to the level of maybe like a physical injury, but that little, those little pieces every day add up. Even the stress of living through, you know, maybe I'll just pick a totally random example, like uh, there's a global pandemic, um, <laughs> you know, maybe just living through a period of time where there's this stress and whatever your personal relationship is to that, um, that persistent environment can cause trauma. These words I have on the side just refer to some different conceptualizations of trauma. So again, that's a diving off point. If you are interested in learning more about trauma, there's some different subcategories and specific types that people research and write about, um, and that can be a good entry point for learning more. So if trauma has such a broad definition, how do we know who's experiencing trauma and who's not? So an important thing about trauma is that it's not the thing that happens, it's how we respond to the thing. Uh, Dr. Gabor Mate says trauma isn't what happens to us, it's what happens in us. And so my example for this is, I want you to picture that you're going to the beach and uh, it's an ocean beach, there's lots of big waves there, um, you go out into the water, you're just kind of waiting, and then a giant wave comes up and knocks you off your feet, the undertow's pulling at you, it's really scary. Um, you eventually kind of swim your way out, you get back on the beach, you're physically safe. That experience for most people is probably stressful, right? It was, you weren't expecting it, you felt unsafe for a minute, um, but not all stress is trauma. What happens to transform stress into trauma uh, is, you know, there's no equation, there's no way to predict what will happen, but a lot of different factors play into it, including, you know, what's the context, what is your personality, who is around you, how are you making sense of it? So if you are a 21-year-old surfer bro, and this happens to you, um, you might experience it as stressful, but maybe not traumatic, because you've, taken swimming lessons, you've taken surfing lessons, you've been underneath bigger waves before, you know the strategy to get yourself out. You might have been stressed, but ultimately you have enough experience that you said, I'm gonna be fine after this, and when you get out of the water, 
your buddies are going to be like, yo, sick wave, bruh, and like fist bump you. And, you know, you're making sense of it. You're saying like, this, this is okay. Now let's think if you are three years old, it's your first time at the beach. You've been swimming before, but it was like at the Y where you have those, um, the floaty things on your arm. Um, when you're in the wave, you don't really know how to get out of it. And when you make it back to the beach, maybe your family's there, but you don't have the language yet, right? You don't have the verbal processing to make sense of what happened. For that kid, that stress might transform into trauma. And, and fundamentally, what trauma does is disrupt our core sense of safety, right? Our core sense of the world is kind of an okay place to be in. And so, like I said, this can depend on a whole host of different factors, which is part of what explains if you um, see two kids in the same family that go through the exact same situation in the home that maybe was stressful or overwhelming, you might have one kid who comes out of that seeming like they're kind of handling it, and one kid who totally melts down is clearly experiencing trauma. It, there's no like inherent, you know, it was no one's fault that that happened. It's just that trauma impacts people differently. And so it's normal for different people to have different responses. So once you uh, have kind of crossed over that the stress has become trauma, how it shows up for you can look in a lot of different ways. So take a second and look at what's here. You might notice some things that don't surprise you on here, like flashbacks or depression, guilt, health problems, uh, fear. Those things are what we commonly talk about when we talk about trauma, right? Um, there's some other things on here that you might not have expected to see, like um, a strong sense of justice, stronger relationships, an increased coping capacity, calm during a crisis. And the reason that I have all of these mixed together on this slide is because you can't get the positive results of trauma without the negative results, right? Like, you don't get to pick and choose and go, mm, I'd rather not feel like crap. I just want to be stronger after this. It doesn't really happen. In the research, this is called um, uh, post-traumatic growth, and it very specifically coexists with post-traumatic stress. The reason this is important to think about is because when we talk about trauma, sometimes we go too far to either end. Sometimes we say, um, in this kind of toxic positivity way, we say, well, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. And that person's so resilient and strong for surviving trauma, and they're a warrior, and you know, let's celebrate them as a hero. That kind of talk sort of erases how hard it is to live through trauma. On the other side, you can also talk in this pitying way where you go, oh, that poor person, they've experienced trauma, they're broken forever, um, life's never gonna be the same, you know, this really like fatalistic response. And so if we go too far to either side, uh, we're sort of erasing parts of the experience. And so again, this is where we think about the lens, not the label. We don't want to just label people with a list of symptoms or um, deficiencies, but instead understand that um, that fundamental sense of safety being disrupted can have a lot of effects on a person. And so we want to be open to actually hearing about somebody's experience of what that means for them. So. This is a lot of different things, um, but there's some specific ways that trauma shows up on really a, a mind and body level, day to day, in acute moments, right? So a lot of these things are maybe um, themes over time, but let's talk about sort of uh, in, in a moment of stress, how does trauma show up? Because the thing about trauma is that uh, it, it is sort of constantly present and it, uh, it overwhelms when new stresses come up, right? So uh, the kid who was at the beach and the wave overwhelmed her, um, she might be really stressed out going to the beach again, but also in other moments of stress, because she has sort of lost that baseline sense of safety, she's gonna maybe become more easily overwhelmed uh, in kind of unrelated situations. So here's part of what that looks like. Um, and I'm gonna ask the microphone people to be ready for some 
sprinting in a second. <laughs> um, so I want you to picture this. You're driving uh, through, let's see, I usually am in New England, right? So I'm like, oh, you're driving on a back road through the woods. Where, where do people usually see deer around here? So <laughs> anywhere, okay. <laughs> All right. You're driving literally anywhere, and, <laughs> and uh, you're driving along, and a deer jumps out across the road in front of your car. It's far enough away that you can slam on the brakes. The deer is fine. You are physically fine. But you have just slammed on the brakes really hard, um, and the deer is hopping away. I want to hear a few responses about what is going on in your body when you have just slammed on those brakes? What are you feeling like in your body? Not your thoughts, what's happening inside your body. Uh, tense muscles. Absolutely. We can, you can go as fast as these guys can run the mics to you. <laughs> I work out. I can run. <laughs> uh, increased heart rate. Yes, heart's pounding. Sorry. <laughs> I have to breathe because I've held my breath. Yes, you've been holding your breath, and maybe it takes you a second to have normal breathing. Dilated eyes. Yes, dilated eyes. Maybe things feel really bright all of a sudden. A rush of chemicals and hormones, adrenaline, cortisol. Yeah, maybe you feel kind of shaky or jittery with that happening. How about your body temperature? What's going on there? Cold, hot, both, either, hot, yeah. Great, all these things. So here's what's happening in that moment. You can get really technical with all of the neurobiological terms for this. I'm not going to. Um, I'm going to just call this survival brain or survival mode. Basically, this is your body's response trying to keep you safe, right? You're feeling jittery and you have those chemicals because your body is saying, we're going to get ready to survive, and so I'm going to put blood to your arms and legs so you can get ready to run or fight. Your eyes are taking in lots of light because you need to be able to see what danger is coming around you. Um, you might feel foggy headed because your brain is shunting all of the resources to those physical aspects of let's run or fight or hide as opposed to let me think abstract thoughts. You might have sort of lost your, um, your verbal filter, right? You slam on the brakes and then you said a word that maybe you usually wouldn't say with the person who's in the car with you, something like that. Um, and so all of these things together um, are that, that survival response. This is a good thing, right? It's great that our body does this because uh, we should have a mechanism to help us stay safe. The challenge is that when we experience trauma, um, like the switch that turns this on gets a little loose, right? So uh, if it normally would take something really sudden and scary, like I almost hit this deer, um, once you've experienced trauma, you might start flipping into this mode at much smaller things. For example, maybe you're driving down the road the next day and you see some bushes rustle by the side of the road. Um, even though nothing came out of the bushes, you're not actually in danger, your brain is still tuned and it says, I'd rather be safe than sorry. And so you can flip into that survival mode again, even though nothing was wrong. Um, and so you'll see this in schools a lot. We're gonna, I'm gonna say something about younger kids right now for a reason, we're gonna come back to college students, don't worry. Um, but you see this in schools a lot with younger kids, right? Where uh, maybe they've experienced trauma somewhere outside of school, inside of school, and then it's a typical day, nothing seems wrong, and all of a sudden they seem to flip out, right? It could have been they heard a banging noise in the next room from the HVAC. It could have been they smelled something that was also in the air at the time that they experienced trauma. There's all kinds of triggers that we're not really aware of that can send you into that survival mode. Before I go to the next slide, I just want to tell you that um, in case you were wondering, I really did tempt karma because a few weeks ago, I did have a deer jump out in front of me when I was driving around, but I started laughing immediately because I was thinking about how many times I've talked about this slide, and I was like, well, I, I deserve that. Um, but the deer was fine, I was fine. It was just like in this scenario. 
So I want to talk specifically about a couple of these survival responses, um, three of which you're probably familiar with and the fourth you might not be. So when we go into the survival mode, you are probably familiar with fight or flight, right? So fight is that response that when we're in danger, we try to fight back. Um, with younger kids, you might see this play out with um, kids literally fighting each other, yelling at each other, um, hitting, kicking, biting. You know, you see a kid getting really escalated, red in the face, you might see them in that fight response. In flight, that's the, I'm gonna run from danger, right? So when you see a kid, and I'm being intentional about talking about kids for a reason, I'll come back to our college students. When we talk about flight, you know, you might see a kid book it out of the classroom, book it out of the school, right? We call those our elopers. <laughs> um, uh, they are gone, right? They're trying to keep themselves safe, they're gone. And you have freeze, right? That like, if I just am completely still, they can't see me um, and they are not gonna get me. Um, it, you might see that with a kid head down, hood over the head, getting under the desk, or simply sort of like frozen, the face is blank. Um, and then you may not have heard of this one, which is called fawn. Um, and interestingly, uh, there's some research stuff around how the conceptualization of fight or flight um, was often really studied on men. Um, and then as they started to understand more about how women respond to trauma, they also looked at this fawn response. This is the idea of if you try to get closer to the person or thing that's threatening you uh, and uh, try to appease them, that's another way of potentially trying to stay safe. Um, so uh, if you see um, a kid who seems to constantly be seeking out the person who's bullying them. Um, if you see a kid who's maybe trying to uh, buddy up to someone who's being mean to them, uh, that can be part of that fawn response. It's sort of that like, if I'm extra nice, if I make them happy, uh, then they're not gonna harm me. So all of these things, I think it's pretty easy to go through these responses and in K-12 education, think about how do kids show these responses? But when you get to adulthood, part of what happens is that these responses are still there, but as you become an adult, you also are developing more of your self-regulation capacity. And so you're sort of mitigating some of these responses sometimes and trying to cover them up, right? Or they're just not coming out in as extreme ways, but you do still see them. And so I want us to take a second and talk about this um, because I, I see these responses in the college classroom. Um, they might be subtle, but you can see them happening. And so I wanna ask you all, um, looking at through these four, how do you see some of these behaviors showing up in the college classroom? And again, you don't have to know if that particular student has experienced trauma, but it could just even be in a moment of stress what might it look like when they go to one of these four areas? I'll give you an example. I had a student who um, was taking my senior seminar. Uh, we were working on writing, and every time I tried to give her writing feedback, she would immediately start arguing with me in this really intense way, um, and sort of like, it wasn't even about what I was saying to her, but it was just sort of like, I, I hate this class, uh, you're expecting too much of me, can you just give me some space, right? Like it was just really intense and unusual for the vibe of my classroom. Um, and I started to sort of realize that, you know, this might be part of how she's trying to keep herself safe from this threat of receiving this feedback, right? Um, she was fighting me on it. Um, so I sort of mapped that to that fight response. So let's hear maybe some examples for any of these four. How, do, how might you see this come up in the classroom or on campus? The, pe right. the people online need to hear you. Um, a couple of different ways. Uh, a student maybe all of a sudden, you know, oh, I got a text. I need to leave the classroom. Mm -hmm. Or the other thing that they just completely kind of drop off the face of the earth or they're not turning in assignments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that disappearance is that same thing, that flight away from the problem. I feel threatened, so I'm just gone. Yes. I had one. Um, 
so I teach the university studies course, just like intro to college. And I had one particular student that every day would have some little semantics thing to, to pick at me about. And he'd go, well, technically that word is not really appropriate. You should have used this word. And sort of like in front of the whole classroom would always just find some little nitpicky thing that was really insignificant, but want to really battle about whatever that was. So mm -hmm. it was a test of patience. Yeah, that could for sure fall under that fighting. Well, when I think of the fun uh, response, I think about students who experience imposter syndrome. Mm. And so it's uh, a way to just be a physical body present, but not necessarily like engaged in the classroom experience. Yeah, they might be showing up, they might be trying to appear as though they're doing everything perfectly um, so that it's not gonna upset anybody. And that's when you also might see maybe a student who has a problem in the classroom or, or wants to give you feedback, but they just don't because if I make you angry, then that's gonna disrupt my safety. Any other examples? Over here. <laughs> Did you guys wear your, wear your Fitbits? Um, also with first year students, like new first year students just this past fall, I saw a lot of freezing. And, and I'm really careful to not just call on people in class unless they're prepared for me to do that. But even just saying, let me talk to you a minute about your assignment after class and just total paralyzing fear about having to interact with an adult that they don't feel particularly close to. Absolutely. <laughs> Is this on? Okay. Um, I had a student last week, we were starting class with a really low stakes quiz um, and it gave you know responses immediately and she scored poorly and she literally just like threw, threw up her stuff and ran out of class. She left her things. Um, and just could not like be present in that moment with that score. Mm -hmm. So all of these examples, you know, I think sometimes people hear these type of examples or they see this type of behavior. And if you're coming at it from a really deficit focused place, you could say a narrative like, oh, well, these students today, they just, they want things to be easy or they don't have the persistence for college, things like that. But if you frame it through the lens of being trauma informed. Left fielder, number 15, Kelly Monahan.
for Warner Pacific. Third baseman, number 28, Kerrigan Foster. Unfortunately, you know, schools are not magical bubbles where all the trauma happens out there, but then once you walk onto campus, this is a safe zone and no trauma happens here, right? Um, trauma happens inside of schools at all levels because people are inside of schools at all levels and people harm each other. Um, at, at schools, people can experience trauma from their peers. Um, people can experience trauma from the curriculum they're being asked to learn. People can experience trauma from the high stakes of, you know, tests and achievement. There's all kinds of ways that, again, you know, things are not universally traumatizing. They might be stressful, but folks may experience it as trauma. And so part of being trauma-informed is saying, I don't want anybody to leave this place with more trauma than when they walked in, right? So how do we disrupt that? And then the third piece is preventing future trauma from happening in the world, which is, I just went very big, right? But this is really, you know, a lot of us, when we got into teaching, we did it because we said, I want to help shape the next generation. I want to bolster democratic citizens, you know, those kind of big ideals that we have. For me, this is that connection that uh, we want to think about how can I prepare students to be people who are not going to go on and perpetuate more trauma in the world. So when we do things like teaching digital citizenship, teaching critical thinking, teaching how do you disagree with someone without canceling them on Twitter, right? Like when we do those things, we're trying to help create a less traumatic world. Now, in addition, um, equity is a huge piece of trauma-informed education. A lot of times uh, schools and colleges will look at their equity committees over here and their trauma-informed work is over there and never the twain shall meet. But to me, they're really one and the same because the same things that cause inequity in schools are also causing trauma. Um, and once you experience trauma, you can experience inequity in school, right? Trauma can cause uh, challenges with memory, with emotional regulation, with health. And so if we consider that as like a um, overall condition that needs some accommodations and support, when we ignore that, um, we're not creating equitable access to education for students impacted by trauma. So we're not gonna dive deep into these principles right now, but they're in the book. Um, and they really just look at if we want to be both equity-centered and trauma-informed, we need to really be grounded in this idea that um, we're focusing on the person, we're addressing the causes of um, the way that oppression shows up in our schools so, and how that is causing trauma, how that's creating inequity. We're being proactive and not uh, singling particular people out. Um, we're looking at changing the system, all of those pieces. And then the last kind of clarification I wanna make about trauma-informed education, because people always say, well, are you, are you saying that teachers should become a therapist? because I'm a professor, I'm not a therapist, and so you know, I can't be trauma-informed. You both don't have to become a therapist, and you should not, <laughs> unless you happen to be one um, as part of your professional life, uh, because trauma-informed is not the same thing as trauma-specific. Picture trauma-informed as the umbrella, and then trauma-specific can be one of the pieces underneath because trauma-informed is universal. We're not picking out individual students. We're really transforming the whole school. Um, it involves everybody, it's proactive, and we're looking at how the whole system can be transformed, whereas trauma-specific might be an element underneath trauma-informed practice, right? Even if I reshape how school looks so that people with trauma feel safer and more welcome, there are always gonna be people who need some extra support and so trauma-specific approaches would look at connecting those people with someone who is qualified to guide them through that extra support. 
especially recognizing that as the professor, that's most of the time not gonna be you, right? Boundaries is really huge in trauma-informed education. I have a whole chapter in the book about boundaries, so um, read that. <laughs> um, so I wanna talk about how we can make this show up in our uh, classrooms and environments at the college level. Because especially for those of you who are um, in the education department or maybe in health services, or you are helping prepare young professionals for a variety of human facing fields, you might be listening and thinking, well, I want my students to be trauma informed young professionals. I want them to go into their field and be responsive to people who have trauma. I want them to be um, nurses who are gonna be inclusive of survivors. I want them to be elementary school teachers who know all of this stuff. But to really carry out a trauma-informed approach, you also need to experience what it feels like to be in a trauma-informed environment. And there are some really simple ways that we can get started with creating those environments. One concept that's really helpful to this is the idea of felt safety. So oftentimes when we talk about safety at school, we think about things like, um, well, I'm going to let my students know that this is a safe place. I'm gonna be a safe person for them. But the thing about safety is you can't ever define for someone else what is gonna feel safe. Uh, my example here, you see that like suspension bridge thing over a big ravine. Um, if I'm walking in the woods, I'm on a hike and I see one of those bridges, um, I personally am afraid of heights. Uh, if I walk up and there's a sign next to it that says this bridge is totally safe, I'm not going over it, right? Um, I'm not trusting the sign. What I am going to do is I'm going to use my senses to tell me if the bridge is safe. I'm going to listen and hear if the bridge uh, sounds really rickety when people are going across it. I am going to uh, look and see if there's other folks who are hiking and if they're going over it safely. I am going to maybe look and not the sign that says this is safe, but maybe I'm gonna look for more specific evidence like last inspected on or you know, this was built a couple years ago, right? Like what's the maintenance look like? So in short, I'm really using my senses to inform me whether this is actually safe rather than just trusting somebody else's assessment. So it's that same idea that if our senses are the ones telling us go into survival mode because you're in danger, our senses can also tell us feel safe because you're fine, right? And so when we think about creating safety in the classroom on campus, it has to be more than saying that it's safe, it has to be creating cues that you are safe. And so there's no checklist for this. There's not a rundown I can give you that if you do these 10 things, then you'll be safe. Instead, what I have are priorities. So this is called the four priorities of proactive decision making. And it's really the idea that these are four elements of safety for people who experience trauma, that if these things are present, it helps create those cues of feeling safe. Um, the first is predictability because trauma makes us feel that the world is not predictable. Trauma often feels very random when it happens and it destabilizes us. And so when we have cues of predictability, it helps us to feel that uh, we can sort of calm down, right? Um, even just simple things like when I walk into the classroom, do I know where to sit? Do I know what's gonna be expected of me today? Um, is there a routine for when we get started? When I walk into my advisor's office, do I already know what we're gonna talk about? Or have I spent the last two hours having a panic attack because my advisor just said, can we meet? And I think I'm about to get kicked out of school, right? Um, the elements of predictability sort of give us those cues of, um, I know where I'm going, I know what's gonna happen to a reasonable degree, like knowing we can't predict the future. Um, and within that, I can sort of settle myself down. Now, predictability doesn't mean being rigid because the next priority is flexibility. Flexibility is necessary because as we talked about, trauma impacts us all in different ways. Um, and even for the same person day to day, trauma can mean different things for what we need and how we feel. For example, if I'm going through a really hard time, there are some days when I feel like I need to stay busy, I'm gonna clean my entire house, I'm gonna reorganize a closet I haven't touched in two years, 
and that feeling really busy is gonna help me feel better. You know, students might, I, I wanna do all my work, I'm gonna stay on top of things, you know, being busy and in my routine is gonna feel good. There are other times when I'm having a hard time that I would like to lay on the couch and watch 16 episodes of The Great British Baking Show. Um, and sometimes I need that, right? Like sometimes you just need to let it all go, not be responsible for anything, and just sort of feel your feelings or numb out or whatever it is. And sometimes that's what you actually need for your mental health. So sometimes your students might actually need that mental health day. Sometimes they might need to come to class but just do the bare minimum as opposed to being super involved in every group thing that you have. Um, sometimes when you're counseling a student about their grades, um, maybe you strategically talk to them about, listen, with how you've been doing this semester, I don't know if an A is gonna happen, but what would it look like to get a C and feel really good about passing the class with a C, right? It's this flexibility where we sort of let go of how we think things are supposed to go and instead meet the student where they are. Um, and the phrase I invite people to think about with this is multiple paths up the mountain. We might all be going to the same place, whether that is the proficiency of the class that you're taking or graduation requirements, um, but how could I let go a little bit of how I think that climb is supposed to look and actually walk alongside you with what you need? Do you need hiking poles? Do you need to take the gondola because actually you can't hike right now? Um, do you wanna stop and wander around and look at the squirrels, right? So how can I be as flexible as possible and how we get there? Next we have connection because trauma is disconnecting and isolating and often trauma really thrives in secrecy and uh, in silence. And so uh, the stronger we build connections, the more we help to both buffer people from future trauma, that's one of the things that helps stress not become trauma is having a strong sense of, of connection and relationships, and then also heal from trauma. Almost every single modality of healing from trauma is really based in relationships. And so, um, some people take for granted uh, the existence of relationships for students, but especially at a residential college, uh, students can feel very isolated. They can feel alone, and if they're not really supported in building relationships, uh, they can simply continue to feel alone. And so thinking about being very intentional about how we're creating those points of connection, how they have multiple people that they feel like they can talk to on campus, whether that's students or friends or, uh, or professors, advisors, um, thinking about as my student goes through their day, are they going to be addressed by name in every class? Are they gonna have the opportunity to speak to someone in every class? Even if that's just as simple as what Ben Affleck are you today, right? That student's not gonna leave class without having someone looked in their face and said, how are you doing today, right? It can just be 30 seconds, right? But how are we making sure that that connection really happens? And connected to that, people like to talk about resilience a lot. What the research on resilience says is that resilience is less about your internal resources and more about who's around you. And so if we want students to be resilient and to take on challenges, then they need that sense of connection. And then finally, I spill on myself. Um, <laughs> finally, empowerment. By empowerment here, I don't mean just feeling good about yourself. I mean literally feeling that you have power and agency and using it because trauma strips power away from people. Trauma makes people feel disempowered. So to feel safe, people need to feel that their wants and needs matter, that they have some control over their lives, and that um, they have the agency to sort of be the author of their own story. And so thinking about you know, things from how we teach, right? Are students having the opportunity to choose their own topics of interest? Are they having the opportunity to um, present in different ways? Are they having the opportunity to learn in hands-on ways, right? How are they taking that empowerment over their learning all the way to their plan of studies or their involvement in clubs or leadership opportunities, right? How are they really building that sense of um, people respect what I want and need, people allow me to step in and take charge of my own plan, um, and they're there for me if I'm gonna make a mistake, right? I can still, I can still try that. 
And so there are little and big things we can do with all four of these to really promote uh, those cues of felt safety. You can think about things uh, all the way from, you know, what do I put in my syllabus that indicates these four things, right? Um, what can I think about in my lesson planning, right? Like one of the ways that I use these four priorities is that I'll pick up, you know, something I have for class, whether it is a project description or the syllabus or um, my late policy, and I'll just walk through these four in my head. Is it predictable? Is it flexible? Does it foster connection? Does it foster empowerment? I can also use it when I am thinking about a challenge that's coming up. So that student who was continually arguing with me when I was trying to give her feedback, I can walk through these. So first I can say, okay, where is there a sense of predictability? If I'm just wandering around the class and stopping at her desk to offer her some feedback, maybe that actually feels unsettling because she's never prepared to receive it. Okay, so how could I actually put in some predictability around when are you gonna receive this? Maybe you have some time to process it. Flexibility. Um, am I really hearing her about what she needs out of the class? Has she had a chance to give input? Um, am I allowing her to not have that feedback conference with me if she's not in the space to hear it? That ties into that empowerment piece as well. And then that connection. Do I actually have a relationship with her? I feel like I do, but maybe that's not enough from her. Some people need you to really prove that you can be trusted before they're gonna let you in, especially if something as personal as writing, you know? And so just walking through those four things allows me to move forward in that frame of, I'm gonna create these cues for safety. I'm going to um, do that in a way that's built on a knowledge of trauma and uh, really provide that student the feeling of experiencing a trauma-informed environment. And then that allows them to turn around and create it for others. So beyond those four priorities, there's additional things that in K-12 schools um, we might see when we're talking about trauma-informed education, like an increased focus on emotions and mental health, like social-emotional learning, policy changes, things like meeting basic needs, right, food pantries or a closed closet in a school where students can come and get things that they need or their families can come in, restorative practices related to discipline, soft starts in the morning so that students have a chance to transition into the day, teachers feeling more supported, um, the physical space being designed with trauma in mind, right? So having natural light, um, not feeling like your school's a prison, <laughs> um, that community building, hands-on learning, wellness. Um, all of these things are things that trauma-informed advocates are really seeking to incorporate into K-12 schools. And so, as you look at these things, I wonder if anyone has thoughts on what prevents us from doing any of that in higher education? Because sometimes, right, we talk about these things, people go, well, I'm a college instructor, so you know, this doesn't apply to me. But does anyone have thoughts on what's preventing us from doing some of these things in higher ed? Or are we? Are people doing, you know, do you feel like we've got it? I don't know if I have an answer, but I, I guess I would, I would, I'm thinking about um, when you talked about like process versus outcomes, and I, I think that's what I, I see a lot when I'm working to advocate for students is that, um, like even just talking about what the sharing power look like, and 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 in in like practice and also in how. We, there's an ideology, I guess, in higher ed that it's a, your students are coming to gain knowledge and somehow there, it's not a, a true learning environment where we can learn from each other. And I guess that's also one of the things that I think not only makes it hard, um, I guess, as a practitioner, but also even students not knowing if they can share their, their challenges and their barriers. Mm -hmm because there's this kind of like generations of thinking of what we're, you know, what this is supposed to look like mm -hmm. and trying to like almost deconstruct that is 
difficult. Mm -hmm. I was trying not to ask the question in too leading of a way, but you got right where I wanted us to go, which is that there sometimes is this, you said ideology or just simply this environment around higher education where there's this sense that, well, we don't need to talk about emotions here. We don't need to think about wellness. Um, we don't need to teach in as engaged ways because this is college and it's rigorous and, you know, when I went to college, it was hard, or when I went through my, you know, licensure program for whatever my field is, right? There's this feeling of um, we don't need to worry about all of that because this is this is higher ed. Um, but I would argue that uh, higher ed should be a little more like elementary school sometimes because our students are still people, um, and I think especially at this point in the pandemic. Um, students have missed some really formative experiences of growing up and they have missed some opportunities for feeling cared for and feeling supported through their educational environments. And so uh, some of these things require us to really unpack, um, do I have some beliefs about what college should be like? Do I have some beliefs about what college students should look like or do or what they need to overcome? And really just unpacking that a little bit, like doing our own work around, am I projecting some of that onto other people? Um, because it's gonna require some of those paradigm shifts um, to move us forward. Um, we're right almost at our time where we're gonna shift into Q&A, so I will just leave you with, you know, as you go forward thinking about with these four priorities, something I like about this is that it provides you so many entry points because like I said, those cues can be big or small. You can just start to think about, all right, next time I welcome students to my classroom, let me pick one of these four areas, and I'm just gonna do one thing in class that's gonna foster that. I'm going to take an extra five minutes for connection. I'm going to um, put an extra two sentences on my project description so that students understand uh, when they're gonna have to share work out loud and when they don't, right? some more predictability. So really thinking about from your role, where can you tap into these things? And so where I'll end is just saying that, um, you know, when I talked about what is trauma-informed education, all these different areas and all these changes, it's a really big project. There are a lot of things that um, if I was gonna wave a magic wand and tomorrow our whole US education system was trauma-informed, it would be a lot of different things, right? It'd be a lot of different things. So we can't do it all, right? Um, I don't think this is a shift that in my lifetime will be fully realized. And at the same time, we can and we have to get started because there are people impacted by trauma right now in our school, in our classroom. There are people who are struggling and there are people that are going to become impacted by trauma during their time here. And if we can figure out some small way to get started on creating these connections, on helping them feel safe, then we're helping to disrupt some of that core sense um, and really help people be more well and help people heal. So thank you so much. I'm looking forward to some questions. Mm. I'm kind of going at this from an SEL lens because we, I was talking with some other educators about this and Oregon is, is uh, beginning a mandate coming in the next year or two where all districts need to uh, integrate social emotional learning into their curriculum. How do we, how can we work to address and inform the general public that the, about the importance and the relevance of SEL and not let it fall into the new CRT thing that already is beginning to seem to happen in some districts where parents think that SEL is, is like critical race theory and all the other things that they're, they're being kind of playbooked into pushing back on. Mm. I have sort of two, two maybe conflicting thoughts on this. The first is that um, CASEL, which is the Coalition for Social Emotional Learning, um, and sort of, um, they're sort of the, the clearinghouse for a bunch of different programs and they do advocacy. 
Um, they just this week started pushing out some great resources for educators um, with talking points, with clarifying myths, because obviously they're very aware of this. So I would say one thing is go look at what they have to offer. They have some great tools. Um, but the other thing is that um, we want to be careful. Uh, we want to be careful with validating the premise, because if we go and we say, oh, well, SEL is not like that CRT thing. Don't worry, it's not like that CRT thing. What we're doing is validating that we should be scared of CRT or something, or that um, it, it's okay to you know, ban CRT, but don't touch our SEL, right? Which I, I know isn't what you're saying, but um, you know, so, so in some ways, uh, I think making sure that we are advocating that we shouldn't be banning any of this and that uh, you know, being clear about what social emotional learning is and isn't, but then also just being really cautious not to set up this false binary that these things aren't related because if we're not teaching accurate history, if we're not um, providing books that have representation for all of our students, then how is that social or emotionally positive, right? Like that's harming social and emotional wellness. So just being nuanced in our approach to that. Thanks for being here. Um, I've been in higher education almost 24 years, part-time as an adjunct and then permanently. And one way I would describe higher education is people defending belief systems. <laughs> so one is how do we navigate that to help the student? And number two is, this is older data, 70% of faculty on a college campus suffer from imposter syndrome. Mm. And I had it when I was a faculty member. Everybody is out to get my research and steal my ideas. and so kind of become an introvert and hide. And then how do faculty who might have imposter syndrome help students who might have imposter syndrome? So if we can't help ourselves, how can we implement some of those things that you kind of shared with us? Mm. Um, if I knew how to fix the toxic culture of higher ed, I would be really rich right now. <laughs> um, there are, you know, and in, in different places, I know it has different levels of intensity, but I certainly, have experienced some of that as well. Um, I think that one thing I go back to often is um, uh, Margaret Wheatley writes about leadership and she has this really great and nerdy book called uh, Leadership in the New Science where she talks about lessons on leadership from quantum physics. I promise it's a really engaging read, but um, one of the things she says in that is that change is never a matter of critical mass, it's about critical connections. She talks about the importance of really the building relationships, which obviously is a big part of trauma-informed ed as well. And to me, whenever I'm really facing that feeling of scarcity or toxicity um, or you know uh, uh, co competitiveness, I find that if I just try to build a relationship, it doesn't solve things necessarily, but it helps me navigate forward. Um, you know, sometimes people who I perceived to be, you know, my enemy on campus, once I actually talked to them, <laughs> you know, it, it was a little better. Um, or it clarified for me that this person and I are not going to be aligned, and so let me spend my energy somewhere that, um, that can be that critical connection and we can do some work and I'm not gonna worry too hard about getting this person along with me. So that's one element. And then around just the ideology piece, um, I think for students, one thing I've done in, in those first semester seminars around you know, sort of how do you exist in college, um, really just trying to make the invisible visible and talk about the hidden curriculum and you know, just explain to students, uh, you're gonna have professors who are gonna do things this way and the reason they're doing that is this, and you're gonna have professors doing things this way, and the reason for that is this, here's how you navigate that. So just really trying to increase that predictability through just explaining to them, here's what these dynamics are. You know, the leadership piece was important because Steve Jobs said, if you wanna make people happy, don't go into leadership, <laughs> sell ice cream. Mm -hmm. And I am from the home of Ben and Jerry, so. <laughs> but I'm also lactose intolerant, but they have some really great non-dairy ones now, so. So, we don't know what we don't know until we know it. 
So what happens if we put ourselves in a situation that we don't foresee something going wrong and then something goes wrong in our classroom and we know we cause trauma to that student? What can we do as educators to, I mean, obviously we go back and we fucking go, ooh, no not to do that again. But I think maybe it's more validation of, I know I did something wrong, I need to change it, but what is that internal piece that we need to be aware of when we know we unintentionally caused harm, because that's what it is, it's causing harm to individuals. What is that self-talk we have to provide ourselves, or what is that knowledge that we need to move forward with so we can move past that and not try, and attempt to not do it again? Mm. Um, I think one part is really slowing down and allowing ourselves to have whatever reaction we're going to have. Um, and I talked about this with the Teacher Pathways program last night, but you know, just taking the moment to set aside, I'm not going to do anything, I'm not going to email anybody, I'm just going to feel miserable for a little bit about how this went down. Um, having one of those critical friends who you can go and process things with. Um, but then also, you know, not assuming how someone responded. And one of my um, go-to strategies around really connecting with students and trying to come from that place of, of not judging is there's, um, there's a, a child psychologist named Ross Green, who if you're in K-12, you should check out his work on, uh, he calls it collaborative and proactive solutions. And it's sort of this communication strategy to uh, collaboratively solve conflicts with kids. Um, and he writes parenting books too. Uh, and, and one of his strategies when sort of sitting down with a student to try to understand what's going on with them is to simply describe what happened and then just say, what's up? So for example, if you were doing this with a kid who had been you know, tearing apart their worksheets every day, instead of going, hey, you're tearing apart your worksheets and you really can't do that because you know, those are your worksheets and you have to get your work done. Instead, you just say, hi, I noticed that you're tearing apart your worksheets. What's up? And you really work on the neutral part. Like, you have to almost like practice that like acting <laughs> class. We really practice the neutral part of it. Hey, what's up? And so I think in a similar way, if you feel like, wow, I really messed up in class. I think that I you know, harmed somebody. You could, um, you could open it up with your class or with a few students and just say, hey, so we had this class discussion. I noticed that um, uh, some people left early and other people seemed really checked out. Um, what's up? How do people feel about that? Just really coming with that neutrality and then allowing the conversation to kind of guide us where to go from there. And I will echo uh, Matt, thank you so much for being here. I'm gonna try not to like rant, but um, I do I have a, good a, rant, um, so go for it. <laughs> I do have a question because there's so many things that come to mind. I work in our um, diversity office. And one of the things that you know we, we do with students is we have kind of a list of like, here's who you go to for classes or, and as I was listening to you, it, I started to reflect on, I don't want that list anymore because I should be able to have like not be helping students find you know safe faculty or safe courses but really think about what do you want to do and how do you know that you can go to that major and actually be successful in it um, and so I, and it's different things right like we have students who are you know, I can't do that because the technology that I'm being asked to purchase is completely not something I can afford to um, things like, um, you know, how we, with well intentions, we would say things like, uh, you need 50 to 70 hours outside of class to do this. And so, because I care about you, I will tell you that this is what you need, which translates to the student that I can't quit my full-time job, I might be a single pair, whatever that looks like, it means that the other component of their identities, they have to give up. Mm -hmm. And so, um, but then at the same time, I, I think about several things, like, I'm gonna try again. Um, I think about um, sponsorship in this, in this work, because it's, as Matt said, there's um, faculty staff who are also trying to be advocates, but they don't know that 
they have sponsors, right? So sponsorship in how do you validate that something is um, may not be seen as important by the small, um, by a few people, but it is important because it addresses a gap. Mm -hmm. um, and so I guess I, I guess my, my thought around that is, what does that look like, and um, what does that look like for how we can develop maybe a community, a campus community, when we can, you know, instead of just saying we're allies or we're advocates for each other, that we sponsor each other in kind of making some needed change that allows us to continue to be trauma-informed mm. and maybe equitable too. <laughs> I love that idea of sponsorship because it's sort of, it's like that shared ownership of like, I'm invested in your, like investing in another faculty or staff's success and sort of saying like, I have high expectations for you as my coworker that you can make some shifts here. Um, you know, what you're saying just made me think of um, a big part of my work uh, is looking at how it's not just about the classroom or the four priorities, but also the systemic changes and the structural changes. Um, and in the book uh, chapter, I wanna say nine, but I could be making that up, or 10. I don't know, there's a chapter about policy change in there. Um, and I really walk through uh, questions you can ask to really look at, um, is this policy equitable? Is it trauma informed? Um, and I would also recommend the work of uh, Paul Gorski who talks about um, uh, poverty in schools, again, in mostly a K-12 context, but it's very applicable um, for things like, you know, uh, if, if this thing requires that you do 50 hours outside of the classroom, are we actually only making it accessible to students who don't need to have a job? Are we only making it accessible to students who don't have a disability and need to rest when they're not in class, right? Um, and those conversations really need to happen constantly and proactively and result in changes to our programs because otherwise we're sort of, you know, creating this inequity factory, right, where certain programs are not um, getting students from diverse backgrounds uh, because they can't meet these inequitable requirements. And so it's sort of this thing of working at that person-to-person -person level, but then also being really engaged with the programmatic level as well um, and making sure that we don't just leave it to one or the other. That doesn't answer all of your rant, but <laughs> but it's, it was a great rant. <laughs> so I, I've spent time thinking about and learning about, you know, how to make my lessons and classroom environment more predictable and more flexible. Connection, I struggle with a little bit, but working on it, I get it. I wonder if you have like some some concrete examples of how we could work on the empowerment part. Like how can we foster that sense of empowerment for students in the classroom? Mm. Some of the things that I do in my classes off the top of my head for empowerment, um, one is that um, just sort of my messaging about classes is really about, you know, as an adult learner, which all of our college students are, even if they're 17, you know, we're treating them as adult learners, really just sort of um, helping them shift this paradigm because in high school, there's really this sense that your learning is about meeting the requirements of your teacher and you're really accountable to your teacher. In college, you really have to make a shift to being accountable to yourself because really, um, even though we want to support students and coach them through their programs, we have to help them start to understand that, um, you know, you are the person who's going to care the most about leaving here with a degree or meeting whatever the goals you have are. And so when I talk about my classes, really talking about, um, you know, this learning is for you, here's the ways that you can think about making this learning yours. If you ever need to adjust an assignment because it doesn't quite fit with how you might best do it, here's how you can ask me about that. Um, and, and when they come to me and say things like, um, is it okay if I'm absent on Thursday? Um, just little moves like saying, if you need to be absent on Thursday, then you should be absent on Thursday, right? It's not about my approval. Um, don't ask me to go to the bathroom. You can, you know, you can decide if you can go to the bathroom. <laughs> like, so, so sometimes it's just little moves like that with the goal of 
um, shifting them into that mode of I'm in charge of my education here. Um, and then I just provide a ton of choice and you know opportunities to you know choose topics and things. You know I also teach in humanities and writing, which is very customizable. And so I know that probably in a in a course like I don't know chemistry, maybe there's less opportunities. But I also there's probably great chemistry teachers who do a lot of student-centered stuff. So I don't know. Um, so there's some of that, and then. Um, you know, I'm just trying to think off the top of my head other things. Um, but yeah, I, th I think I would really just go back to that orientation of um, how can I communicate in both my lesson structure and then those interpersonal moments that um, you are in control of what you get out of this class. And so, um, you know, here's how, here's how you might do that. Oh, the other big thing I do is that I, I use ungrading which some of you may have heard of, where essentially you don't use letter grades throughout a course. And there's a lot of different methods of it. Um, there's one particular one called contract grading that I think is great for empowerment, where students basically look at what work is gonna be asked of them and they sign a contract with you about like what grade they're aiming for and how many things they're gonna produce in order to earn that grade. Um, there's some great resources out there on that. So I think some alternative grading models can be helpful as well. That's a whole other can of worms, though. All right, we have time for one more question, if there is one. Yes. <laughs> In a teacher preparation program where teachers are bringing SEL into the classroom, how can we also get the teachers to understand that they need to practice what they're also teaching to their students because that seems to always become an issue uh, with teachers trying to take on too much mm -hmm. trying to do too much and at the end they're just completely um, you know their their health comes an issue mm -hmm. yeah I think it's all about modeling so um, in some of uh, actually in pretty much all classes that I teach um, I start every class with a circle where we do rose and thorn, and I tell my students, you're gonna think this is so cheesy the first time we do it, but you're gonna like it by the end. Um, and it's just, you know, rose is something going well for you today, a thorn is something not going so well. Um, at the end of my classes, uh, if they meet once a week, I typically have them do a little Google survey that reflects on how they did in class, including something that says, you know, how was your participation today, and, you know, was there anything going on for you that influenced your participation. So they're doing that reflective moment on how was I today. Um, we'll incorporate things into the curriculum as well. I do a, a series of lessons about, um, you know, uh, our, our emotional response to learning disconfirming information. And I do a piece around the backfire effect and how our, you know, when our threat responses kick in, we can reject information that we didn't want to be true and I have them I do that early in the semester and so then throughout the semester we check back in on you know how are you like are you having an emotional response to this learning how are you feeling about it feelings wheels emoji check in like there's all the SEL things that you might do with younger students just actually do them in our classes um, because again when they experience all of that it helps them internalize both what does this feel like and what am I asking my students to do? And so then even building in the layer of like the meta reflection, right? So sometimes I'll do a class where um, I have students uh, uh, slow down and we'll do journaling moments throughout a class session. And then at the end, I ask them to reflect on what did it feel like to slow down and journal during class today? What felt bad about it? What felt good about it? Um, and so that meta reflection on what am I gonna be asking my students to do and how did I feel when I was doing it? Plus, the doing all that stuff is fun, so <laughs> it's, it's fun for me to do those little activities and so it makes, it makes class fun. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, Alex has agreed to sign some books if you're interested in an autograph. Um, if you're hungry for more, <laughs> Tonight, 6 o'clock, um, she'll be doing a community keynote address with open student um, community members, whoever would like to come. 
Um, the topic will be uh, learning how unconditional positive regard can be a powerful equity stance that honors students' full humanity and helps them learn. Um, so a great opportunity for folks to come back. Um, to those that are on the live stream, sorry about the little intermission of softball, but um, you came back and just know that the full recording will be uninterrupted should you choose to view later. Oh. Um, and then I will share also just a, a hand to Alex for coming out to LaGrand. First experience in Oregon and the, the weather did not disappoint, but you might see some deer around. Um, so let's go ahead and give her a hand. Thank you. Thanks so much. And um, we do have a couple door prizes here. So Ryan Scariano is a winner. And Sarah Ralston is the other winner. There'll be more door prizes tonight. So um, please help yourselves to cookies, um, coffee, tea, fruit outside. And hopefully we'll see some of you back tonight at 6 o'clock. If not, enjoy your beautiful day. And we'll see you again next year. We'll have the same series, different speaker each spring. <laughs>